Yo, this is Deontay the Bronze Bumma Wilder, heavyweight champion of the world, and you're watching Real Fans Real Talk. Live from the camp. Uh huh. This is Real Fans Real Talk. Real Fans Real Talk. We as real as you thought. Real Fans Real Talk. We the illest of course. Real Fans Real Talk. We the illest of course. Real Fans Real Talk. We as real as you thought. Real Fans Real Talk. Reporting live from the camp. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez You heard what I said, we elite Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets It's Johnny Flores, bringing a different type of blend Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9 for the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursday. The, the ESPN report that came out yesterday, I believe, uh, there were players who were talking about when they checked into the hotel after their flight, that they were actually ripping down the NBA banners off of like the civic center and the convention centers across the street. Okay. Right. Like the, it was getting really intense with the protests and obviously with the way the government felt over there about the tweets. So it was like, you know, we're over here and we're in harm's way. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why would you even do that? Why yeah. not, you know, save that comment or that tweet till after we get back home? Right. Which I think that's what Adam Silver did by holding a press conference today. He wanted to wait till all the guys were back before he expressed his views on it. Yeah, I think Adam yeah. Silver is always does a good job of like saving the NBA or like just speaking out for them because this wasn't his mess. He didn't cause it. Right. So. Yeah, but yeah, he definitely he, he stepped in from the from the jump. He said, you know, he's not gonna be fired, but uh, he definitely, you know, he waited for the right time. The guys are back now. Unfortunately, we had all of the backlash going, you know, with LeBron and and everything. I mean, this is burning jerseys. That's I guess that's the new trend now yeah. with, uh, with 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 the fans. But um, I'm, I'm I'm glad that everybody's back home. But now the NBA has to figure out this situation because. You are like talking about millions upon millions of dollars that are potentially going to be lost now yeah. from uh, from the NBA. A lot of relationships that are, are going to be broken and mm -hmm. probably yep. won't be mended anytime soon. Yeah. So. And let me let me ask you, Rashida. So LeBron got obviously a lot of negative feedback for even speaking out on basically not agreeing with you know supporting Daryl from saying those comments. Do you think that? players are kind of scared to have a political stance now that you, when you see Kaepernick has lost his career from feeling a strong way about a political stance. How do you feel about like that? You know what, Em, I think players are a little bit intimidated yeah. about coming out and stating their political stance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I think what happened to Kaepernick was completely unfair. Mm -hmm. I think um, how LeBron made a, a, or even backing a statement, I think um, with all of the attention mm -hmm. that has come from that, um, this is something that's, I don't want to say minor, yeah. but I, I feel like we have bigger problems <laughs> happening right now in the U.S. Right. And I think yeah. LeBron made a statement about that. I think he said, he did. let's worry about the U.S., yeah. America, yeah. the States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we got enough going on here than to worry about what's happening in Hong Kong. Right. And I think moving forward, I think people are going to be a little bit less prevalent to kind of take their stance. Yeah. Um, and I think they're going to think twice yeah. um, about what can, you know, potentially happen moving forward. Yeah. And that was actually my issue with the tweets. You know, I'm I'm all for you know speaking out against social injustice anywhere. But Daryl Morey is is not someone like say a Greg Popovich or a Steve Kerr who have been vocal about social injustice uh, mm -hmm. issues. So you know he kind of this kind of was just out of like left field. And then you have the the situation where a lot of people around the world feel like America is very arrogant. Yeah, and, and they dip their nose in up. They're very yeah, nosy. Absolutely. You should mind your business. Like, you're not even speaking out on stuff that goes on in Here. your own country. Well, well, you, well, you have situations like, uh, you know, the them when I can't breathe t-shirts mm -hmm. or the Miami, you know, taking the, the with the hoodies and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear you Black speak on matter. speak on those issues. Yeah. yeah. And these were big issues where the NBA was really taking a stand, you know, on things. And I didn't hear you say anything. So now you want to jump out the window. This this has nothing to do with you. We're talking about a, a, a country that's across the world. And at the same time, 
what we do here has no bearing on what they do there and, and vice versa. Yeah. So just because we have freedom of speech here in the United States, mm-hmm. we don't have freedom of speech over there to criticize in, over in there. China. And, I, and I'm, I'm very sure there's a lot of things that Americans do where, you know, the Chinese, oh, we don't, you know, we don't rock with that. Yeah. Yeah. But mind your business, mm-hmm. you know, like because because something like this. You know, could lead to something even bigger. Yeah. You know what I mean? In in, in a really bad kind of a kind of a way. Right. Yeah. And I'm so, glad you brought up Popovich because that goes back to the point about Team USA. That's the players were all warned, mm-hmm. like just stay out of this, don't talk about it. And they were warned well in advance. They weren't just like told when they landed. And these NBA players that were getting ready to go over were warned as well, which I'm sure the front office guys were. Mm-hmm. Daryl Morey knew better. Yeah. Like this was a situation where he, why right? Don't say anything. Yeah. You know, for you to jump on social media the night before you guys are heading out. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, and then not knowing all the details. of His his, his <laughs> excuse after taking down a tweet was that he didn't understand everything that was involved with this. Well, that was even more reason why you, you should have just kept your comments to yourself. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's so interesting you say that because LeBron's backlash that I've been seeing all day has been basically that one comment when he said that Daryl Morey did not... You know, he was misinformed. He didn't have right. enough knowledge on it. And people were attacking him for saying that. But he said that. But he said that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I just feel like the players, they're on the I front think, line. And yeah, they take yeah. the brunt of everything. It's very easy for general managers or the commissioner or people to say these comments. But these players are the ones that are physically going at it. Their last names are on these jerseys that are getting burned. Absolutely. Their families are in harm's way. So I just think... It's always been an issue to me that, you know, the, the players are on the front lines and everyone else can sit back and make comments that can potentially harm the players. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think LeBron <laughs> even had a sweater that said no clout, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of players are doing things for clout. Mm-hmm. To what yeah. extent do we stop and say, oh, my God, this is a sensitive topic yeah. right, that I shouldn't be commenting on until yeah. I know further facts. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the you know, as you, as you mentioned about not knowing, I think people got mad at LeBron. Because he started off the comment by saying sometimes freedom of speech can be negative because it can affect financials, yeah. so, you know. And so people just wanted to take that part they of the quote that part, and yeah. just yeah. latch onto it and say, "Also, oh, because this is big business, mm-hmm. we shouldn't talk about it." Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in actuality, Daryl Morey didn't know enough about the situation, yeah. and there are people, yeah. even though we are a democratic country and we feel that's the way it should be. Yeah. There are people who don't agree with the protesters from yeah. Hong Kong. There are yeah. people who feel that they're being too violent or they're being too extreme in their protest. Mm-hmm. So there are people on both sides of the fence that were mad at Daryl Morey for putting that tweet out. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just people who were against China. And yeah. if, you're, if you're really against what's going on in China, then, then have you had a meeting with Adam Silver and said, well, I don't want to do business with China anymore oh, absolutely because this not. stuff is going on? I doubt it because I'm pretty sure you're still cashing whatever Listen, checks that come in. The yeah. Rockets are the marquee China. team over there. Yeah. They, they do. Yeah. Um, in Asian night, they have the jerseys in Chinese lettering. Yep. So why you at, why haven't right. you stepped down yet? Right. I said, you know what? If you they guys take this are, trip are annually gonna, over there. Stop yeah. dealing with so, China, I'm just going to step down right. and away from the NBA. Well, I think I think it's safe to say that this does not by any means take away from what LeBron has, what he's done and no. his impact on the community. So. Because I seen where Muhammad Ali's ex-wife made like crazy comments yeah. saying, you yeah. know, he saying that he would never have done this and you should have stuck up for Hong Kong. But then LeBron's to the point of you brought up, like yeah. he was like, I don't know enough about what's going on over there. I'm gonna keep taking care anybody, of the yeah. kids in the hood of Cleveland, and I, and like, think, and that's what yeah. he said. And I don't blame I'm him just, for I'm that just though. Just send those sneakers out to the kids yeah. at the yeah, yeah, and yeah. so <laughs> let's not forget he <laughs> built he built a school. He gives yeah. back to. He does so much for our culture. Oh he God. speaks out on everything more than other players have. So I just think that. They're trying to kind of assassinate his character by this one comment. And I think that's why a lot of players are scared to speak out. Mm -hmm. Because it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right? If I don't agree with you, I'm going to slander your name. If I agree with you, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And unless you're a guy who has that platform like LeBron, I mean, it's tough. Like you said, we see what happened to Kaepernick. Yeah. He's in a situation now where he can't get his career back. Mm -hmm. There's no comeback. Right. There's no comeback. You know, so... If you're a player and you and you know this is a year-to-year thing for me and there's no guarantee that I'm going to play for 10 years in this league, yeah. do I want to run the risk of rubbing people the wrong way who can control my career and my future? Yeah. Yep. You know, it's unfortunate. I think Ali's wife, you know, that, that's one of those comments I don't think you make. I think you got to let the guys be. Yeah. yeah. None of us know what it's like to be in a foreign country where you're not welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Those players were not welcomed after the tweets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure all of them just wanted to get out of there, and yeah. Yeah. that was it. You know, I don't. I'll figure it out later on. I just want to get out of here. I want to get back to my family. Mm-hmm. And, and think about it. We're only a 
about a year removed from the whole Angelo uh, Ball situation over in, uh, yeah. in China as I well. I thought about that. So, you know, it's like, yo, what's up? Like, y'all, y'all straight trying to disrespect us now with this? Now you got this dude yeah. tweet. You know, like, come on. So it, it, it's just a lot going on. I hope they can mend these fences because we don't need it, you know, going any uh, further. So but. speaking of, you know, unfortunate situations, we definitely have to say RIP to Patrick Day. Um, the fighter that recently died, um, he suffered a severe injury. Um, he was in a coma and passed away. So definitely our condolences um, to his family. That was insane seeing that. It's, yeah. it's very sad. This is probably the third box that we've seen pass from mm -hmm. fight related injuries yeah. over the last like three months. Yeah. Uh, very young man, 27 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and he was still working his way up the ranks. So mm -hmm. it's very unfortunate. We send our condolences to his family. And, you know, it's a tough sport. We, we love to watch it, but at the same time, we also know that there, there are those dangers yeah. that yeah. come with that sport. And, and it's I, unfortunate. I think that, you know, we, we spoke on the show a few weeks ago how we uh, went and did the Ring 10 event. And mm -hmm. I think I immediately thought about that. The fact that, again, boxing doesn't have a union. So if, if not this yeah. situation, if there's any good that can come out of just the awareness of the danger of this sport. The fact that he died after a week after the fight do you know how many boxers are still suffering physically? Well, he was rushed to the hospital through. that night. Yeah. yeah, He had been in a coma for a few days. But right. to your point, yeah, there, mm -hmm. there are fighters who... But think um, about getting hit yeah. prior and how it's yeah. affecting your motor skill. You know what I mean? Your brain. So mm -hmm. the yeah. fact that, again, that boxing doesn't have a union, you know, shout out to Ring 10 and all that their efforts that they do. But I think this should bring awareness because that's the first thing I thought about was their protection yeah. you know and and I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, the long-term effects because we see a lot of these fighters that not only have physical uh, deformities after their career but mentally yeah and um, which is kind of gonna lead us into bringing on our, our guest coach D who uh, you know she's she's uh, studies in uh, mental uh, health and in, uh, in, in sports uh, so we're gonna have her actually come on and we're gonna talk about this whole mental health thing yeah. um, and I, I I really want to get into this because uh, recently, Eric, you, you lost your quarterback, uh, Andrew Luck. Mm -hmm. He's, he wanted to step down from the NFL because, you know, the, the mental... It was just wearing on him, yeah. Yeah, illnesses that was going on and it was wearing down on him. Kevin Love recently spoke about the mental illness mm -hmm. that he's dealing with. Uh, Al Harrington, when he was here with us uh, a week ago, you know, he, he was bringing up the fact that, you know, Josh Gordon and how he keeps getting caught doing the same things, you know, trying to smoke marijuana. And he kind of wanted to see, you know, what's going on mentally with him right now um, as to why, you know, you, you get tested once in, uh, in football and then that's pretty much it for the season. But you continue to get caught uh, with marijuana mm -hmm. in your system. There has to be something mentally going on, uh, you know, with you. And, and a lot of players deal with, uh, with mental, uh, you know, illness. So we're going to get into that in a minute. Cliff, let us know if y'all got that Bianca video ready uh, in, in the back. And we're going we're gonna to run with that interview so y'all can see. Shout out to the entire cast and, uh, and the crew of the Defiled Bed 2. Um, this is actually going to be the third show I'm going to play in Atlanta, and uh, Bianca uh, Bonnie from Love & Hip Hop is going to be starring uh, in the play, mm -hmm. and uh, Emerald got the chance to sit down with her and uh, <laughs> talk about the play and some other stuff that uh, that she has going on. Yeah. So uh, whenever y'all whenever y'all ready in the back, Cliff, you can drop that interview, and when we come back, we are going to have Coach D joining us on the set, and, and we got some things we're going to speak about. Yes, I was. All right, well, we're going to wait for one, uh, for one second in, in, in the back, you know. Okay, so we got about, we got about, we got, we got a, little, a little second before we do that. Cliff, actually, in the meantime, could you pull up the website for us, Cliff, really quick? Because I need the people at home uh, to, to be on the website right now. We uh, we just redid the website. We got some new stuff coming out. Uh, shout out to uh, to to Jaleel. Uh, he just dropped off a new blog that'll be up this weekend uh, on the website. A uh, whole bunch of new new videos and some exclusive stuff. So you guys go to uh, realfansrealtalk.com and uh, you can do that. You can drop us off your fan mail questions. This thing looks great. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's looking good right now. You see we got a whole bunch of new clips up there. You see the combo interview is up there. You know, our family from from, uh, uh, from on the, the board, board is up there. Is up Will, there. Will's actually at the game tonight. Yeah, he's, at, he's actually he's at, at the game. He, he, he was at, we he was at game. Play. You have to text him. And get, yeah, he was at <laughs> game, he was at game three, and I saw him post his picture for game four. Yeah. Um, He's there enjoying it. Uh, we as we, as we, off. yeah, yeah and, you know. Why is she showing up the, all the time, man? The, the show, the start of the show, you know. 
Yeah. Oh my god. This is the star of the show. Yeah. Y'all didn't see I was showing off in San Diego, but we can't post some pics. Yeah, and listen, and this is a family <laughs> friendly <laughs> show. Like, this is why you know Th- hey, that's yo. not the image we okay. want to portray. You know, listen, all right, we out here. Chip with but, the uh, with the drip drip. Yeah, I mean, that, was at the, that was at the Emmy, so I didn't want to just go there. You Came know, I was gonna do it like big with my Timbs on, but I was like, nah, I'm you know what? So I'm gonna done. throw the suit on, and you know, we can't have that kind of look. Okay, yeah. getting seasick. <laughs> you know Eric on the So you know, Wait. definitely. Hit up that hit up that website. Uh, we got a couple more. It's, we're gonna keep updating the site because uh, we got a we got a whole bunch of new surprises. We got some stuff coming up. You guys know we got the 2K tournament coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so we'll be working with Family on Three again, raising money for their hospital uh, Christmas holiday uh, gift giveaway. So we'll be hitting up a couple of different hospitals throughout the city. Um, we'll probably try to hit up another couple of uh, family shelters as well, giving out Christmas gifts later this year. Uh, so make sure that you guys are locked in on the website because all the new information will be there. You can also follow us on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Real Fan Talk. You can get any updates that you need to get. Uh, there, uh, facebook.com forward slash real fans real talk, and uh, make sure you guys subscribe to that YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash for the fans productions. That's where you get all the exclusive interviews. You know, some people that come on the show, we can't just put the interviews on the live show like that, so we got to save that <laughs> right. for save the, the website and, uh, and, and the YouTube. So, oh, we got another surprise. We got Big Genius is coming back, so he and he got a new book that's coming out. He's gonna be with us uh, next month, so and you know, he got all the all the stories everything that's going on in hip hop period Big G know about it so he's gonna be back with us and uh, we just getting ready for the 2K tournament but we are ready to get get it rocking Coach D how are you welcome Queen welcome you great to have you yes thanks for having me absolutely so tell us a little bit about yourself tell the people about some of the work that you're doing out here awesome awesome so I'm amazing uh, starting with that <laughs> there you go uh, that's a great way to start <laughs> Oh, mm-hmm. thank you, thank you, thank you. I see, I see. We linked up here. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we was there. We was there. there. And then, I didn't know. So my man does that grateful tie. Yeah, has yeah, a lot of wrong. great, like yeah, like, a lot of grateful goods. So I was like, I felt at home when I seen that. I seen the J's. <laughs> I seen my man's clothes. I'm feeling, like, I'm feeling really good. I'm gonna bring something next time. I don't know. I'm gonna get you grateful. Shit. Nah, that's grateful <laughs> good. Right, so, absolutely. Um, grateful opportunities. So you know, I'm grateful for this opportunity. So about me. 100 coaches certified. My mission is mental health and basketball. Mm. Um, I played basketball in high school, um, I, but I had two surgeries. Mm. And then I had another surgery. And so I was taken away from the game. And it, it had a lot, uh, it, just, it took a big toll on me yeah. in terms of my confidence, in terms of how I was able to move. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to stay in the game. And I started coaching at a very early age. I started coaching at 19. Mm. And during that time, both of my parents transitioned. So I was 19. I couldn't really play. I had a bum knee and then both my parents die. Mm-hmm. So this was around 2008, and if you know anything about the social climate, the financial climate of 2008, you had the stock market crashing, you had just everything that could go wrong yeah. actually went wrong in yeah. that year. Um, and so there was a lot of just implications of like, nah, I'm strong, I got this, I'm gonna be good, I'm gonna pray, and I did, and it didn't work. Um, I found myself in the middle of the street a few years later having anxiety attacks and panic attacks, and wow. I wasn't able to tell anybody, because I'm Coach D. Right. You know what I'm saying? Gotta be tough. So, right, I gotta be tough. I gotta be strong. You know, all that BS. And so I said, nah, I need to do something. And so in 2015, I linked up with uh, Coach Rodriguez uh, from Brooklyn. He runs a lacrosse team as well as a football team, the Brooklyn Bulldogs. And he was like, yo, D, I got this class. Come through. It's free. And it was the mental youth mental health first aid. Mm. And that was in 2015. And then after that, I changed my diet. I started doing yoga, um, started getting heavy in the meditation. I went back to school. And it just really, that program really set a tone for me and was the catalyst for my transformation. Wow. Um, I had a lot of reasons I could have been on the street. And it was like, mm, I want something better for myself, for my boys. I was coaching boys at the time. And I, I wanted something better for them and for myself. And so once I got into mental health, it just, it took off. And so currently now what I'm doing, I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, from Cephalo Projects. And my goal was to bring everything that I do back home, back to that block. And so now I have 100 coaches certified. Uh, my partner, Minister Coach, Minister Coach, Minister Jazz, <laughs> uh, she's been able to just help me orchestrate the 100 coaches certified at the Gregory Jackson Center, where I'm able to get people certified for free in mental health first aid services. Wow. 
And so to have that type of program in Brownsville, yeah. ain't nobody doing that. Yeah. Mental health don't look like this. And so that's what I want. I want our people to, to, to move. Well, it on. does. We just got to show, right. you know. Right. We got to show it. Respect. <laughs> I want our people to, to have that, you know, that type of access, that type of knowing that, nah, we got it. And it looked like us. We just got to find it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. You know, that's, that's a little bit about me, a little but bit a lot. No, I no, commend just, you because mm -hmm. I'm sitting here getting chills. Like, so I think our people, we tend to definitely shy away from mental health or we're so used to being tough. So especially, mm -hmm. you know, correlating that to athletes, especially because mm -hmm. our bodies were always strong on, on the outside, but in the inside, we can be falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, not that I had like the same story, but I was a, a big division one uh, basketball recruit. I tore my ACL my junior year, and the depression that I went into, the the depression I went into at that time was so real that it was it was heartbreaking, mm -hmm. and especially because I had the stacks of letters right there, like of schools I dreamt of. So for me, I identified with basketball, or I identified myself and my worth as an athlete. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't anymore, I'm like, what am I good what at? I? I didn't know what I was good <laughs> at. I didn't know what to do, and that's when I started going harder a little bit with school. Um, I ended up running track in college, but even in college, like mentally that first year or two, I, I've never stepped foot into a girls basketball game because I couldn't physically watch it like mm. at my school. And I love ball, right. but I couldn't watch them watch on the it. court because I'm like, this isn't fair. Right. So right. I mean, mentally, I just went through it. So not that, you know, I had anxiety attacks, but I remember just being depressed because I didn't know what how to what my worth was mm. outside of my sport. So that's really important that you know, yeah, definitely. That. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting what you said there when you said I didn't know who I was. Yeah but you found something else. Yeah. And so, so many people don't find something else. Yeah. And so I wanna make a distinction of very quickly. Every, everybody has a brain and everyone has a mind. And so when we talk about mental health, it's not an other. You know, it's just as urgent as physical health. Mm -hmm. We just can't see it. Yeah. So if I cut my finger right now and I started bleeding, everybody in this room would get up and move. But if I had a voice telling me they don't like me, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. No one would see it and no one would know it. Yeah. yeah. But that should be met, I think, right. with even more urgency. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you walk back into that gym and you're like, this isn't fair. No one hears that but you. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And so for me, it was what, what happened for me in terms of anxiety and it actually getting to actual attacks was because I kept quieting those voices and mm -hmm. not listening and not finding the other thing to attach myself to. Yeah. And to really find that support in something different. Mm -hmm. And for so many people, they feel alone. They don't feel like they can have something else mm -hmm. to identify with. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking someone who's been working at the same company for 25 years and they get laid off. Yeah. That's a mental health issue. Yeah. You know, when you talk about uh, Kevin Love, it was actually two years ago he started talking about anxiety attacks yeah. and it did not get a lot of attention at all. Yeah. Because it was such a stigma. Ella Campage, I believe, she also talked about it too. Mm -hmm. Earlier this year, when you talk about Title IX, when these, these WNBA players, shout out to the WNBA, man. Yeah. Shout out to the WNBA and Title IX. Because when you talk about having to play all year round just to make ends meet, yeah. when you got rookies that make more in the G League, then you got star athletes. Like, to me... It's depressing. It, I'm de okay. It's depressing. Like, that's a mental health issue yeah. for me, and I'm yeah. not even a WNBA player. Yeah, we, we had that conversation when Al was here. Yeah. And the three of us were actually like floating out ideas how you could change it. Because we all feel the same way. We've been to WNBA games. We go see the Liberty. And we feel it's unfair. And at the same time, it's like, but how can you make it better then? Yeah. You know? And it's a tough situation for those, for those women to have to play all year round, yeah. leave the country, leave their family to go play overseas, mm -hmm. then to turn right back around and come back and try to play at a peak, at a peak level here. Yeah. 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 It's like, and it's heartbreaking. Sorry. sorry. It, it, I think as a woman, though, too, when you think about throwing kids in that mix and yeah. like yeah. having like a husband, <laughs> but you put your career first, you know, physically, because right. you're at the top of your game. Now everyone is able to bounce back like Candace Parker or certain people right. who are able yeah. to have the kid and, and, you know, still win a championship, et cetera. But I think just being a woman and the pressures mm -hmm. of career, right, and then having a family, having kids, these athletes in the WNBA, it's unreal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the sacrifices they make mm -hmm. to not even make what, what they deserve. Yeah, yeah. especially like so when you throw in the fact of wanting to have a family and children, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now you're shortening, shortening your career even more, mm -hmm. right? Right. We know an NBA player on average probably gets into his early 30s before it kind of dwindles out. Yeah. Before a WNBA star is like, what, I'm supposed to play, what, four years? And then I got to focus on something else. I got to yeah. give this up. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That's tough. Um, but I wanted to ask you, because you were young when you kind of understood you, you were dealing with some things. Yeah. How tough of a hurdle was that to admit, like, okay, 
I don't have it all together. I know I'm dealing with some, some issues and I got to figure this out. I need a little bit of help. How tough of a hurdle was that? It's so interesting you say that. So I'm a woman of quotes. I love quotes. And there's a quote that I read two days ago. Okay. And it said, um, change happens when you're tired, which promotes the absence of fear. Mm. And so my grandmother used to say, um, baby, you know, don't add more trouble than what you already promised. And so for me, I, I, I feel like what was most challenging was not admitting it, but being what I had just admitted. And so what I mean by that is I could say, ah, I got something going on. I need to change. I need to change. I need to change. I need to change. So many people do that. But it's actually being the change that you want when you can't see it, when there's no circumstance around you that actually promotes this change being a value. Mm. And, you know, for me, it was having friends that didn't understand. Like I said, I, yo, bro, I was homeless. I didn't have any parents. My sister wasn't living, you know, with me. Um, I had no money. And the only thing I understood was HRA and boys basketball. Like, and for me, it was like, well, I could choose this and be mad about this. Or... I can make a decision to get something better. And I think for a lot of people, it's about recognizing the blessing. We all have life-changing moments, mm -hmm. right. but many of us don't allow the moment to change our lives. And for me, I had way too many life-changing moments at once to yeah. not change my life. Yeah. So, uh, how, all right, so one, I mean, because what, what happens is in situations where a person may not even understand that they're dealing with some kind of a, of a, of a mental issue, and two, how I guess do once you once you do realize that, what would you say would be the next step in order to to try to gener generate some type of help for yourself? Support, 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 mm -hmm. support, support, support is super important. I think for someone that may not recognize that they're having a mental health issue, um, I think it's the people around them. Um, I also think that again, mental health is something we all check in with daily, which is something that I've been promoting with the 100 Coaches Certified. You know, a lot of coaches, they go to clinics and have resources for athletes, but never for themselves. I'm sure when you guys go to conferences, it's to talk to other people, mm -hmm. but it's very rarely to check on yourselves. How are you feeling today? Yeah, that's yeah. true. You understand what I'm saying? So we as a society, you know, need to change that. For anyone who's listening today and they're like, hey, you know what, I, I may be dealing, you know, with something. The distinction is the four L's. If for over a two week period, your ability to live a full life, your ability to love and have meaningful relationships, your ability to laugh, or your ability to learn is, is deterred, is, is, um, is swayed or, or hindered in any way, then it's an issue. And these things are, you know, you have signs and symptoms. You may not be able to see the symptoms, but the signs are evident, hygiene, change in mood, change in behavior. And so it's about not only being able to recognize it in someone else, but first and foremost, being able to recognize it in yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I think for everyone, mm -hmm. it's not about seeing it as an other. And the way that we help everyone and anyone dealing with this issue is we be an example for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in my, with my friends, they're like, yo, what you doing? Checking in, girl, I need a minute. Yep. And like, that's not, that's not pseudo for me, like getting my ish together. No, that's really me taking 15 minutes to ask myself, what opportunities do I have today? How do I feel? And really being present with that. Some days it's sad. Mm -hmm. Some days is happy and really being present with that and showing the people around me that mm -hmm. it's okay to yeah. not always be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I think it's funny because you're a woman of quotes. So one of my favorite <laughs> quotes um, is, you know, you, you can't pour when you're empty. And I know sometimes I get into that where it's like you're a people pleaser mode and mm -hmm. you're just like, it's like people who are sucking you dry mm. and it's like you have to decompress, you have to fill yourself up. And I think sometimes I've seen people just deteriorate because of how much they're just giving all mm. their energy away. And, you know, so I think that's extremely important. Um, when I think about even the black community um, not recognizing mental health and then you see a kid that's acting out in other ways, it's like this, it's so clear sometimes outside looking in, like this is a result for how they're feeling. And they may be exercising that in ways that are hurting people around mm. them because they need someone to talk to. Right. So I commend you for going back to your neighborhood and bringing, bless, that, bless. bringing that in because that's so imperative for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting what you say when you talk about the young kid who's acting out. Um, for black people specifically, it's trauma. Yeah. Right. And so for a lot of us, when we talk about trauma, we talk about comorbidity. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, we can talk about anxiety and depression all day. What makes me depressed where I'm looking you know, back and something from 
you know, two days ago, I'm still griping about, or two years ago, or I'm anxious where I'm worried about, yo, I'm gonna get this bill paid, how I'm gonna get this, or how I'm gonna get that, and I'm so far in the future. And it's, it's, it's the challenge to be here, but for a lot of black people, a lot of black and brown people, it's hard to be here when there's so many things that happen back there that we're taught to keep pressing on and they come back and we don't know why. Because yeah. we you haven't uh, dealt with them. Yeah. We just push them to the back and we kind of just move right. forward with our lives. Right, and without, without really having the tools to mm. navigate it emotionally and effectively. Yeah. You know, um, I want to give a big shout out to Minister Jazz because that's her word, effectively. I, I also have a radio show coming out where I really want people to get, in, get into it because like, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about mental health in a way that not just palliable, but it's like layman almost, like mm -hmm. talking about mental health like Antonio Brown, you know, and his clear need for attention and a hug. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When we're talking about someone like Kyrie Irving who's swapping teams because he want to be the star, but not really. And really getting into that, getting into Kevin Durant mm -hmm. and talking about the NBA feeling like a circus, but still wanting to be number one. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we reconcile our greatness and our light when we cannot deal with our darkness and what pains us? Mm -hmm. And for us as people of color, that is the biggest thing, dealing, navigating, healing, you know, mm -hmm. whichever word makes you feel safe, mm -hmm. our traumas, yeah. we all have them. Yeah, and it's difficult when you look at, you know, uh, pop culture and certain things that we find maybe funny in the black mm -hmm. community, in the, in the black family, that's mm -hmm. like, that's not funny, it's really abusive when yes. you really analyze it, yes. right. you know what I mean? And I've seen, but, wait, I've seen, <laughs> wait, my you, um, grandma, that I don't like that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, and it's, uh, it's, I just was seeing memes recently about like a mom and daughter conversation that at first you laugh at it, but they're like, this is really like a self-fulfilling prophecy of you yep. calling your daughter this, yep. like calling her out her name. Like, yep. it's not something that we should be used to hearing. Yep. And so it's really, uh, important to identify that so that's that's it's crazy <laughs> now, with with your work with the youth and you know trying to get them to open up and speak about things they're dealing with like how how do you feel social media plays into that because a lot of kids are, are fearful of what others might think if right. they open up on their feelings I mean I think a lot of that is not giving energy to that mm -hmm. so what I do with the youth very specifically is athletic yoga um, and so uh, athletic yoga is yoga and yoga designed for the athletic experience. So those who are used to competitive, up and down movement, loud energy, that's what athletic yoga is designed for. Um, I personally used uh, this method to come back from the three knee surgeries that I had. Yeah. And so for me, it's about giving youth safe space to just be. Not getting out or expressing or releasing rather, it looks so many different ways. And one of the issues with therapy is that it's not culturally synchronistic. And so what I've been doing behind the scenes is through the 100 Coaches Certified in the Mental Health and Basketball Initiative is developing this type of therapy that's mm -hmm. culturally synchronistic to our youth and what they need. Our expression may be in the arts. Mm -hmm. It may be visceral. It may be textile. It may be experiential. Mm -hmm. It may not be verbal. Mm -hmm. You know, and, f and for youth, I think it's about movement. Mm -hmm. Getting them to move because their bodies are at a state where they, their brains are not developed enough to tell them what's going on, yeah. right? A lot, when you, when you talk about adolescent, your body is here while your mind is like, wait, I'm not ready. <laughs> you know, your, your body is doing a whole bunch of things. And yeah. so movement is a great way. You don't gotta use no words. Mm -hmm. Do what I do, let's play Simon Says. Yeah. And really get the body moving in ways because the body and the brain is connected in every single way that we don't give attention to. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing things, like for example, if, you free, if you're doing your free throws, I, I look at the free throw as meditation. Mm -hmm. Because you gotta have a rhythm, you gotta have a breath, and it's still, it's quiet. You gotta yeah. quiet the noise. <sighs> You're able to release. And so whatever that release is for you, you know, and for youth specifically, I do it through movement and athletic yoga. How do you uh, become a member of the 100 Coaches? So you go to a link in my bio and my Instagram pages <laughs> and my website, um, and you go right to that link. You click that link, and you can register for these classes. These classes are held at the Gregory Jackson Center, mm -hmm. Brownsville Partnership, and Brownsville on Rockaway Avenue. Um, and every month we're having a class where I will be teaching. And so um, we have classes for the remainder of 2019. Mm -hmm. The goal is to reach 100. Mm -hmm. um, once I reach 100, then I'll be doing my own certification specifically for basketball, dealing with youth anxiety, yeah. and also dealing with coaches and depression and burnout. What's mm -hmm. the website one more time? www.getfitflyright.com. Y'all got that at home? Make sure y'all got that. Mm -hmm. Write that down right now. I say it one more time. <laughs> www.getfitflyright.com.
Let me let me ask you though, um, you bringing this program back to your community, how receptive, you know, have the kids been? Because this is literally disrupting the status quo. Like this is mm -hmm. not something that athletes or even black people are advocating for, I find often. Mm -hmm. So how receptive are the kids? So with the athletic yoga, the kids are very receptive mm -hmm. because it gives them safe space to breathe. Yeah. There's no judgment, there's no expectation, mm -hmm. and there's complete connection over competition, which mm -hmm. is the slogan. Um, my goal is to get youth connected mind and body. Mm -hmm. So that way when they go play, there's a sense of peace and there's a sense of play. Play is without the intent of harm. And so when we play, you know, we have the ability to, to really move and create yeah. and manifest and be our best selves because we're playing, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, for the adults, it's the 100 coaches certified. Yeah. And them coming to that class because it's an adult mental health mm -hmm. class. It's not for youth, it's for you to learn about what's going on with adults, with our language, with how we move and navigate the day and how others perceive that mm -hmm. and knowing that you're not alone. So it's for everybody, it's for adults, it's for youth, I'm trying to get the world right up here. Absolutely. You, you talked about pro athletes earlier, you know, obviously being a sports show, we talk about some of the situations, but what are your thoughts, as you mentioned about like Antonio Brown and seeing the way like he's really carried himself over the last year, mm -hmm. right? And then he's not the only one. We've seen other football players, basketball players, baseball players. Like, do you feel they're at a point because they're so high profile, it's tough for them to get over that hurdle of saying, hey, I need help, or this is what I'm dealing with? Even Lamar Odom, like, I mean, I think right. he... Yeah, it's a lot of factors, but I think we don't create the space as a society for anyone to get help. I don't think it's just athletes. Yeah. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm using them specifically because they're at a platform and at a level, as you mentioned, that when Kevin Love came out and said it, mm -hmm. it was almost met like, nah, whatever. Right. Like, people yeah. didn't want to admit that it's possible for this guy who's making millions of dollars, living out his dream, right. could be dealing with some issues. Because it, 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 and I don't know if this answers your question, I pray that it does, but it taunts the demons in them. Mm -hmm. Right, because if it's an IO and right, the, it. the first per, if I yeah. so athletes, I personally feel like the athletes are the the biggest representation of people. Period, in the way that they move, in the way that we idolize them, outside of maybe musicians, but I think athletes are the biggest form of representation moving globally. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about Kevin Love saying, "Hey, I have anxiety. I had an anxiety attack on the bench," and then people go to that, they're more or less talking about themselves. And so I think what's harder for athletes is getting the help that they trust yeah. more so than coming out. I think for people, the coming out is not an issue because then it others people. I think it's about I come out and what will come out of it is yeah. more so the issue. I don't think it's an issue to say, hey, I, yeah, I got a lot of money and money ain't everything. Tupac yeah. been saying that. Because you have a lot of, uh, you know, as an athlete, or in, in the center in general, you have a lot of people that, that are around you to take advantage of you right. because of the, the money and the status that you right. have. So, so then right. that trusting becomes a major issue. Right. And so as I, as I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, Adam Silver today, I believe, was talking, if not today, then yesterday, he was talking about the, um, the new mental health initiatives mm -hmm. that the, the NBA is going through, which I think yeah. is great. Yeah. Um, I heard, you know, and, and I'll say heard loosely, um, I was able to shout out to Royal Ivy. I was able to do his camp this year. Okay. And so, and just sitting and talking with, you know, with just like different people around the game and like, hey, what's up? Why don't, you know, guys, you know, seek help? And mm -hmm. they're like, no, they want it, but they come to coaches and coaches don't have the tools. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm talking wow. to different people in the NBA and I'm talking to different people, even at the high school level, and I'm talking to adults, I'm not talking to players. I'm talking to coaches because coaches know what their guys and girls need. Right. Yeah. You know, and so if you if you if your athletes are coming to you and you don't have the tools, what do you do? Oh, we're gonna send them to the clinician. But here's the thing: in our culture, right, the clinician is hard because they are taught in a science that may not necessarily resonate culturally. Mm -hmm. It may not. It may not have the cultural competence. It ain't about race at this point because we both black. But I grew up with a hot comb, and you grew up with locks. Yeah. I grew up with ham hocks and you grew up vegan or you grew up Rasta. Yeah. So it's about having cultural competency. Yeah. And so I think that's the issue. Yeah. I don't think it's players not uh, feeling like they can come out because I don't think it's about coming out. Well, I think it's more about if I do mm -hmm. say I need help, yeah. will I get the help that yeah. I need? Well, when I say come out, I mean like, yes, I'm, I'm sure behind the scenes there are those discussions that we never know about, right? But because of the scrutiny that players are under, right? So when Kevin Love says I had an anxiety attack, there are some who revert back and say, well, that's what happens when you play with LeBron James. He can't handle the pressure. Right, right. right? So now there becomes this negative stigma towards that player of he's weak. 
He can't right. handle the pressure of playing on that level. Right. Right. Or Lamar Odom. Mm -hmm. We see how he just, you know, it, it was just a complete outburst. Yeah. And then immediately became, well, he was married to a Kardashian. What do you expect? <laughs> right, right. Right. So right. there are people who are scared of well, what comes with that. No, but Lamar. whether it's true or not, what I'm saying is people get scared now because it's like, man, if I come out and say this, right. now are you going to try to pick apart my life yeah. to yeah. tell me what right. caused no, no, no. this? I, yeah, I, right. right. Yeah. Definitely. Prime example, let's just. Kanye West. Like, right. I, after right. Get out my head. He died, it was like this man, we were literally watching Kanye West cry out yeah. for help, like just completely in his music, his actions, like mental health 100%. He had, you know, cosmetic surgery, changed his body, appeased to people. And it was like, I felt like the whole world was laughing at him or criticizing him. But it, he was the prime example of a cry out for help. Right. So, yeah. you know, I think it, to your point, yeah, like these are mega stars that need, you know, a trusted a uh, person that's going to help them. Right. That's someone that's going to Right. How do you now, if if you're on the outside looking in and you're seeing this happen, now how do we reach mm. Kanye, who, you know, who who is who he is, to say, well, maybe you might need some help. Maybe you might need to talk to somebody. Because, right. I mean, we're not just, uh, you know, I think his mom would probably be the most trusted person that he right. had, and now she's no longer right. there. So how do we now get to Kanye or get to an Antonio Brown wow. or a Boogie Cousins or a Josh Gordon? I think I think it's not doing that, not uh, uh, Kanye, uh, uh, because then we other them, we yeah. other people right. again. Okay. And right. so um, when doing this work, I can't subscribe to the negative backlash because it's always going to be there. But when we highlight, it's like it's like uh, I, I used to be a dean. And so I was the person that came in with the keys and you have the bad kid, quote unquote, and then the victim, quote unquote. When you don't give them those titles and you find out the humans, what mm -hmm. happened between the humans, mm -hmm. <laughs> then everyone can be human. And so I think for me in the work that I do, it is imperative that I don't subscribe to the, hey, that's going to happen. You know, I want to encourage and empower people to feel safe in coming out and getting those effective tools. And I think it's really about the support and the people that surround them yeah, and sure. having that access and that that ability to assess without judgment, mm -hmm. you know, not putting them on a pedestal, not calling them by their name. Kevin Durant said something when he talked about when he had the circus comment, um, he was saying, you know, I just want to be Kevin and play ball. Mm. So I don't even know if Kevin Durant calls himself KD. Right. The world does. Yeah. And so I think once we once we as a people you know, as a society, have these conversations, have these talks. Um, people get signed up for mental health first aid and for the athlete project certifications, you know, and have this type of awareness around mental health and how to just navigate it for ourselves first. You know, we on a plane. What they tell you, take the air mask, bring it down, put it on yourself first before you save somebody else. So if we think of mental health like that, then it won't be where we're seeing so much negativity. We're seeing more pockets. Yeah of black people, of athletes, of quote unquote tough people, mm -hmm. you know, saying, hey, yo, I need, I need therapy. And it yeah. doesn't look like this, it looks like that. And people being more aware, Kanye is a perfect example yeah. of that, of, of transformative recovery mm -hmm. and, and therapy where he was like, look, I'm going to church. Yeah. I need God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's one thing, one thing I do know, uh, so in uh, Snoop's Breakfast Club interview and he was talking about Kanye, and uh, he said, you know, one thing I think that Kanye needs is he, he's lacking strong black woman in his life mm -hmm. that to sit him down and tell him like, yo, you, you, you know, you're acting out right now. You're doing the wrong thing. And I, you know, from looking at his circle, I didn't really see any strong black woman in, in his circle that, you know, really understood, like you say, the culture of where he's from yeah. and, the and culture what he's dealt with, mm -hmm. it, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't see him around any black woman like That's that. That's a great point that you both made because if you think about the consistency in not only sports where all the players are typically minorities, right, mm -hmm. and all the owners are typically unrelatable to their environments, yep. right? So you have, a, you talk about this often on the show, you have a band of, of white males that are GMs and, and commissioners, Presidents right? and VPs. Presidents. Yeah. Same thing in the music industry. All of these rap artists that go to labels, of people who didn't grow up like them, look like them, didn't know, mm -hmm. you know, what, what a hot comb feels like on a Sunday. Like, they don't, <laughs> they can't relate, right? Right. They also, it's if hot they, if it burn the back of your neck. Girl, <laughs> that ear? Because I used to have braids back in the right, day. Right, the grease right there. there. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Thank God for locks. if they go to them and say, I have a mental, you know, I have a, a situation that I feel from my childhood and my past that's maybe dysfunctional and as black people, it's like they can't even relate mm -mm. to the amount of broken homes and lack of fathers and the, and the financial 
Um, you know, so it's just, uh, I think that's a part of it too, that you can't even relate to the culture. Yeah. yeah. So you don't, you don't know what that looks like. Yeah. You know? No, yeah, absolutely. Really right. quick, uh, Cliff, we just, we're going to play a little bit of that, uh, interview and then we're going to come right back. So you can just run it really quick, Cliff, and then we're going to come back in and we're going to get ready to close things out. Hey, it's your girl Bianca Bonnie from Love and Hip Hop New York. You already know I'm rocking with real fans, real talk. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Marie here, and I'm with the beautiful and gorgeous Miss Bianca Bonnie. How are you? Hey, how you doing? Oh, well, wow. so <laughs> nice to finally meet you. Definitely. So you are a singer, rapper, songwriter, designer, business owner, and actress. Yes. Is it the Harlem Hustle? Like you, you got a lot going on. I mean, I get it how I live. <laughs> Now we're here, um, you know, rehearsing for the play The Defiled Bed 2. Mm -hmm. What got you into this play? It was just an opportunity that was given to me, so I was like, Shh, I'm gonna take it. Like, I never did this kind of, you know, play, or I, it was just like a different element to me. Yeah. And I always try to go outside the box. I mean, you only live once, yeah. so you might as well try different things. And I'm good at acting, so yeah. like, why not? And, you know, for doing a live theater play, there's a certain level of vulnerability that mm -hmm. you have to have to captivate an audience that you don't, you know, necessarily have when you are having the opportunity to, you know, record a movie. Right. How challenging was that? I mean, this this is going to be challenging because I'm new to it, yeah. but I mean, I accept all challenges, yeah. like, you know. It's, it's just whatever, I'm just down to get it done and just see how it come out. Okay. You either love it or hate it, yeah. but... They gonna love it. All right, and tell us a little bit about who your character is, and just you know what did you have to do to prepare to get into this role? So my character is Zoya, and as, right now I don't have makeup on at all, like bare face, and I guess I'm getting prepared because my character <laughs> is bare face, like she's in jail, and so I'm gonna have on an orange jumpsuit, like really gel gel, and um. Yeah, it's just like basically a different element because when I'm always glammed up and I'm always, you know, playing a part of superstar role, this is just like a totally different mm -hmm. thing. And it probably helps you get into character just being like makeup off, yeah. just completely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That's literally the depiction of what you're going to have to play in her Absolutely. character. Absolutely. So uh, Trevi Prochet, I mean, she's a director known to do faith-based um, films. Mm -hmm. How is that component with kind of her faith and her wanting to display the love of God and, you know, praying for her? <laughs> so how is that? Well, I mean, I, I just really, like, I... It's crazy because my whole life I never went to church. Like as a kid, my parents didn't really bring me. Like they had their own, they they time when they went to church or whatever. But as me, me growing up, I never was in church at all. So when I moved to Miami, like two years ago, I started going to Vu Church, and it's just so crazy because I'm like now that I'm really into God and yeah. into the Bible and into knowing about it, yeah. that I get to do this play. Awesome. So it just feels like it it makes sense, you know, it connects. His, his timing. Timing. Mm -hmm. He speaks in one voice. That's a fact. All right, so tell us what else you have going on, um, business adventures. I think you should talk have, video to celebration. Yeah, <laughs> I have so much going on right now. Celebration video just dropped. Um, me and DJ Websaw are actually revamping a record that we came out with called Get This Work, and okay. we're doing a Get This Work challenge okay. because um, this boy band BTS from Korea remade the Chicken Noodle Soup song. So I made the record Chicken Noodle Soup, and it's been 14 years since the record came out and they just remade it like with the artist Becky G. So it's been a crazy like phenomenon. phenomenon. I was on, they made me go viral on Twitter, number no. one, for like three days in a row. So it's just been crazy. Like the internet's been going really crazy and they like recreated the whole chicken noodle soup thing. So it's just like, it's, it's a legendary song that's timeless, that will yeah. never die. So we're getting into doing more dance songs for the culture and you know, for the kids and stuff like that. So just working, grinding. So you beat me to it because I was just about to get into that. But you trending globally, and you yeah. you kind of downplayed it right now. So I'm gonna say it to my viewers real quick. Give them a little history <laughs> for those that live under a rock. So Chicken Noodle Soup came out in 2006. Yeah. How did it feel to have a song that is transcending generations? Because you know, as she mentioned, um, J Hope and Becky G remixed it. Mm -hmm. Not only did they remake it, they remade it in a Korean and Spanish version. Yeah. So with you know, music has always been that one global 
language. How does that feel? It's crazy. Yeah. A writer, a writer from Billboard just wrote me this morning and was like, "Oh, can I get on a call with you? We want to do an interview with you." And awesome. I'm like, "Billboard, like yeah. that's crazy. It's just crazy. I mean, the song is just timeless and it won't ever die. So that's what's it's a, it's amazing to me because I'm like, it's 14 years old. Like I was 14 when I did the record. You know what I'm saying? 14 years ago. That's crazy. That it's still being reinvented and it's still out and people still even care about it like yeah. that doesn't happen and a lot of um i think new artists now this generation of music is really different and it's changing but i don't think a lot of people can say that they have a legendary hit that you could that, re that yes. somebody's redone 14 years ago and it came out because listen my nephew is seven and he heard it the remix i was playing it and the fact that he's even singing, it's like weird seeing, looking at him, like, you weren't he wasn't even born. born. Like, yeah. this is my, you know, childhood memory, summertime mm -hmm. vibe in New York, mm -hmm. so completely different. Um, that's yeah, awesome. Dope. I'm so proud of you for even, you know, doing this play. It just, it shows just how you are multifaceted, yeah. for sure. Thank um, you. <laughs> quick question. I hate when people ask other, you know, female MCs to compare and all that because they don't ask it to men. So I'm right. going to ask you that. Right. But I do want to know your top three. Who's in your headphones right now? Other MC women right now because the game is <laughs> definitely changing. Honestly, I could never say a top three or a top five when yeah. people always ask, oh, she's top three or top mm -hmm. five. I listen to a bunch of everybody like when I'm in album mode or recording I kind of listen to nothing because you don't want to sound like somebody like if you listen to a lot of somebody you'll start mimicking like yeah. this sound it's not like you're trying to do it but it's like that's just what happened so I mean I listen to Drake that's my number one artist like I listen to him a lot like I listen to every album just over and over all the time um, I listen <laughs> D does no wrong I listen to Missy um, her new album is dope that she came out with um, she actually wrote me on Twitter like three days ago I'm like yo this is crazy, crazy. Um, yeah I just listen to a bunch of everybody uh, Cardi B stuff yeah. uh, female uh, the female artist Remy Ma that's dope. my sis yeah. um, Little Kim is coming out with a new album mm -hmm. so I mean I listen to a bunch of everybody it's never just like oh I'm just listening to one thing you know okay Bianca so <laughs> what is the ultimate message that you want viewers to take from this play I hope all of you is love and enjoy the play and every bit of it not just because I'm in it I mean but um yeah I guess you know the message is just like God is good all the time and it's really it's it's a lot of different messages in the play like I was just read because I just started rehearsing and stuff for my part but as I'm reading it and, and seeing everybody's parts it's like whoa this is really a dope this yeah. is a dope play overall it's it. yeah, it's yeah levels to it it's really gonna be dope well, I'm super excited. I know it comes out December 7th. Yeah, everybody, y'all better come see this play in tickets. December. Get your tickets now in Atlanta. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Oh, thank you so much. Thank it's you for having me. It's it's Teresa Weatherspoon, better known as Teaspoon, and you're watching Real Fans, Real Talk. Oh, yeah. All right, welcome back. The, 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 the full interview is actually is up on the YouTube channel right now. It'll be on IGTV uh, tomorrow as well. Big shout out to Bianca and the yes. entire cast of The Defiled Bed. If you are going to be in Atlanta, you should definitely go see that on December 7th. It is an amazing uh, play. Um, actually, you know, it, 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 it may actually help you with a lot of stuff we've been talking about today. You know, you watch that, you watch that play, and and see what you know what they're dealing with inside of the play. So yeah, no, it was it was amazing just interviewing her and Trevi Brache and just the message that they had. Um, it it was a phenomenal just the whole experience, and, and I don't want to give it away, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> definitely buy your tickets and support for sure. Mm hmm. And really quick, um, Coach D, um, we're going to let you start off the uh, final thought segment. Okay. Whatever you want to let the people know, you let them know right now. Progress is a process. Take it one day at a time. I can't be hurtful. Right? <laughs> I mean, I'll try to we can end it right I'll there. Say, like... You know what? No, I can't even say nothing else now. My quote not going to be that good. So I can't. Gonna say it. You're going to kick it to Eric so I can thank you. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a quote, but uh, we definitely thank you for coming on the show and educating us today. Um, and then also, you know, keep tuning in. Check out the website, Real Fans, Real Talk. Tune into the social media. Um, our Harrington interview is up there, man. Just keep tuning in. We appreciate the support. Yeah. Yes. And uh, please let us know, because uh, we definitely want to actually come out. Uh, 
to one of these classes because you know definitely. we need to be educated. Absolutely. Um, definitely you know, especially you know, because I know you know there might be someone in our families right now dealing Not with much. it and we mm -hmm. don't know. So I would actually like to to be more aware of of the signs and how we can uh, help. So please let us know and we will definitely come out. Yes, no, I'm definitely sliding in all y'all DMs. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. And, and it's it's Mental Awareness Month, correct? Yes. October, right? Yep. So it's definitely on time. And just to kind of piggyback off what, you know, you're about, you know, guys, definitely it's okay to decompress. Don't, you know, get wrapped up in social media world. I know sometimes I have to just delete the app, get off my phone because mm -hmm. I'm heavy on it. So I definitely commend all the work that you do. And yes. I'm looking forward to see, you know, what's what's more to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. So for myself, Trip Young, Emma Marie, Coach D, Legend in Two Games, and of course Rashida, we will see you guys back next week live. Now check out that Al Harrington interview, man. And that Bianca Bonnie. Squad. Peace. Yeah. Legend of Two Games, rep for Real Fans, Real Talk. It's Taj Gibson Day out here in Fort Green. Taj, talk about the importance of bringing this type of event to the community of Fort Green. It's real important. These are my people. We've been here a long time. They raised me from the far side all the way to my side. This is Fort Green. We stay together. Absolutely, man. You can see the community loves it. One last question. As a Knicks fan, I'm happy you're home. How does it feel to be playing at the Mecca? It feels great. It's a dream come true. I'm just happy to be in New York, happy to wear the orange and blue. My family's excited. It's a dream come true. Absolutely, man. Much success this year and another great event, man. We really appreciate you taking time to speak with us, man. Oh, thank you. Real fans, real talk. Taj Gibson. This is Deontay the Bronze Bummer Wilder, heavyweight champion of the world, and you're watching Real Fans, Real Talk.